everybody, Shanoa Grove here. Welcome to Texas RIAs, Texas's largest association of real estate investors. Excited to be here with you all tonight and share a little bit about what we've learned about real estate investing uh, since we've been investing in Texas for almost two decades. Uh, we're about to celebrate, I think next year, we will be celebrating our 20th year in real estate and real estate investing. And one of the things that we love about what we do is that we get to share tribal knowledge with you guys, with the members of the association. So excited to be here with you all tonight and excited to go through some of the different things that you will find useful in your investing. And uh, for us, uh, and when I say us, I'm referring to my husband and I, we invest together. Uh, when we first decided that we wanted to get into real estate investing, we did exactly what you guys are doing. We went to the local real estate investor association. Uh, it was there that I got my first deal and it was part of the real estate investor association that I got my last deal. Uh, so what I love about this association is there's always an opportunity to throw off deals, to throw off opportunities, to throw off money funding for those deals and to throw off uh, the tribal knowledge that is necessary in order to grow, go and grow to the next level. Uh, a lot of times when it comes to real estate investing, people will uh, watch the TV shows, uh, get excited about investing. Uh, they'll watch the YouTube channels, right? And get excited about real estate investing. Uh, and what you'll find is a lot of times you have some of the ingredients, but you don't necessarily have the formula. And after all, that's only uh, important if you wanna make money in real estate investing. So as we go through the presentation tonight, I'll be sure to give you uh, a little bit more uh, detail in terms of what to do next as a real estate investor and the different things that uh, can both uh, work in your favor and as well as the things that might not, might not work in your favor. Uh, so we'll talk about uh, the different ways to win as a real estate investor uh, and as well as the different opportunities for losing money as a real estate investor. In fact, that's actually one of the topics tonight as we share tribal knowledge. We're gonna talk about some of the things that I've uh, very recently, in fact, last night, had to get on a call with a real estate investor who was about to uh, put at risk about $35,000 and didn't know if they were actually gonna get that back. For me, I'm all about taking a big risk as long as there's a big reward, but I'm not about taking a big risk if there's a little reward, right? So we'll talk about that as we go through the tribal knowledge uh, present part of the presentation uh, and the uh, uh, tips and best practices as we go through. So every week we get together to talk about real estate, talk about investing, uh, talk about growing our businesses together, talk about what we're seeing in the marketplace so that we can all kind of rise up and be more successful uh, based on where we are right now. And uh, one of the things that we would love for you guys to do is also join our social media channel. So I think everyone here who's with us in person uh, was asked to join them as you guys were checking in. And then for those of you guys who are online, hey guys, want to make sure you're following us as well. Uh, we ha have a YouTube channel, uh, we have a Facebook account, we have an Instagram account, uh, we have podcast. Uh, so no matter how you consume information, we are there and I uh, want to make it just easy for you to get that information. So for us, uh, from this slide, for those of you guys who are watching the presentation instead of podcasting, uh, we always say we are Texans teaching Texans how to invest in Texas using strategies that actually work in Texas. It breaks my heart when I see someone come in to uh, the, the meeting and tell me that they're you know, working with an out-of-state guru uh, for their Texas real estate investing business. Uh, because typically what I find is those out-of-state gurus will usually send you here to the local real estate investor association, usually because they can't go more than PowerPoint deep on any explanation that they have. They can't give you any of the local resources. They can't give you access to the MLS. They don't know the contracts in all of the different areas. In some cases, they might not have access to them because they might not be licensed. In some areas, you have to be licensed to be able to get some of those contracts, specifically the commercial contracts that we use here in Texas. And uh, sometimes you're getting knowledge and information that uh, sounds really good, but might not actually work here in Texas, meaning it might not actually be legal here in Texas. So I would caution you guys that are, uh, and I'll just ask the question, how many of you guys are at university right now? How many of you guys are at YouTube University right now? Yeah, okay. Um, so, so make sure you know the state that the person that you are listening to, uh, where they are from, because the laws are different in every single state 
And what I've seen a lot of people come into the Real Estate Investor Association and ask about is, well, what about tax liens? And what about quick claim deeds? And what about, you know, all of these things that are lease options, all of these things that don't really work in Texas. So you get really excited about it and you do all this research on it. And then you come to the source who can tell you whether or not something's legal or something works here in Texas. And I have to kind of pop a little, pin. it's not a little pin, it's, it's going to be a big, it's like a kaboom. Uh, so I don't want that for you. I don't want that for any of you guys. So if you're interested in investing in Texas, you have to be surrounded by other people who also invest in Texas and have those resources so that you cannot be, um, what, I, what I see a lot of uh, new real estate investors doing, which is playing pin the tail on the donkey which basically, you know, we put a, you know, an eye covering over your face, spin you around about 10 times, give you a stick and say, go for it, right? Uh, that's usually not going to work out that well. So when I say, you know, follow our podcast or watch our YouTube channel, it's so you can get information about investing in Texas. Now, if you're not investing in Texas, I'm not the, I'm not the woman for you, right? Uh, I go very deep in my niche, and my niche is Texas. I understand the laws here. I'm also a licensed realtor and broker here in Texas, uh, so understand all the contracts. And also have a great uh, resource, a uh, great team of people who help support me in my business because you can't do everything in your business, uh, not if you want to grow and scale your business. So uh, that's one of the things that we get to do here as part of Texas REAs uh, to help you all be successful as well. So. Um, if you're interested in investing in Texas, you're in the right place. If you're interested in investing in other uh, states, then I can't, I can't vouch for that. Uh, just like I probably would not say, you know, come to me about advice and, you know, for investing in Utah. Uh, but I do find a lot of people from Utah come to Texas to give y'all advice, which is uh, very interesting uh, and a little bit uh, disconcerting, but uh, something to be aware of. So. As part of Texas Rias, I want to go ahead and play one of our commercials since we Would you like to be a real estate investor in Texas? Come to one of our free local meetings to get access to free training, wholesale properties, capital, and power teams. Click on the link below to find a meeting near you and register for free. So I will tell you a little bit about our first meeting uh, that we attended about 20 years ago. It was held at a local Mexican restaurant uh, and the price of admission was you had to buy a plate of tacos. <laughs> and uh, uh, since then, uh, the Investor Association has grown uh, quite beyond that, uh, but this is a great place to be able to uh, reach out and meet other investors. We also have our Texas RIAs Facebook page. Um, this is where networking happens in between meetings and all the time. Uh, so love to have you guys join uh, Texas RIAs. It's um, a great site. You'll find deals there. Uh, you'll find um, funding there. Now, I can't vet and verify every single post that goes on out there. Uh, so I do ask that as you are investing, that you do your due diligence uh, because Warren Buffett's number one rule of investing is what? Don't lose money. His number two rule of investing is see rule number one. How do we make sure as real estate investors that we don't lose money? We do our due diligence. What, what does our due diligence looks like, look like? It looks like getting the correct ARV. ARV stands for after repair value. It looks like getting the correct repair dollar amount. So from a, uh, from a, from a contractor, right? And it looks like doing a little bit of math. So one of the slides that I had up earlier is what we call our real estate maximum allowable offer formula. So for us, we typically use around 70% of ARV minus repairs. 70% of ARV minus repairs works perfect for your buys, fix, and flips. As long as they're under about that four or $500,000 price point, uh, in Austin, where the price point is well over 600000 can you afford to offer a little bit more as a percentage? And the answer is yes. Uh, the reason why you can do that is because your profit dollar amount is really high using that formula. So we typically make somewhere between 10 to 15% of the ARV, the after repair value. On a $600,000 house, that's somewhere between sixty dollars and $90,000. Do you think you could offer a little bit more and still do pretty well as a real estate investor? And the answer is yes. But if you are investing in smaller towns, maybe an hour or an hour and a half south of here, um, 
where some of those prices might be in the hundred to two hundred thousand or the two hundred thousand to three hundred thousand dollar range you need to stick to that seventy percent of ARV minus repairs formula if you're investing in an area where the ARVs are less than a hundred thousand again your profit percentage is the same 10 to 15 percent of the ARV but your profit dollar amount is only about ten to fifteen thousand dollars so if you make a mistake that might cost you all of the profit on that particular deal uh, so know where that formula will serve you and also know where that formula might fail you right it's a good rule of thumb but you still have to do the rest of the math figuring out uh, what the values are in terms of um, what the numbers are in terms of your closing costs on the buy, your holding costs all the way through, and then your closing costs once you go to resell that property. So um, one of the things that I see uh, on TV is something that I like to call TV profit. Uh, so TV profit doesn't include any closing costs on the buy. It doesn't include any holding costs all the way through. It doesn't include any cost of capital. It doesn't include any property uh, taxes. And here in Texas, we have some pretty high property taxes. It doesn't include insurance. It uh, uh, doesn't include uh, several things. And uh, when you go to resell it, the TV profit doesn't include the cost to sell, right? A 6% realtor fee. Uh, title insurance again, um, maybe a home warranty, maybe a survey. Uh, it doesn't include some of the extra or surprise repairs that you might have or some of the required repairs that a bank might make a buyer do in order to be able to get the loan on that property. So I wanna make sure that you guys aren't operating off of TV profit. And sometimes when you see someone operating off TV profit, they'll say, well, the ARV is 500,000. The repairs are 50, I've got it for 400,000, I'm gonna make money on this thing. And it's like, no, you're, you're not, you gotta go much lower than that because of all of the costs on the buy, of all the costs and holding it and all of the costs on the resale. So I wanna make sure you guys go through your numbers. And I've got a slide that will help uh, illustrate and demonstrate that as we go through the presentation as well. And I'm curious, how many of you guys are out there doing marketing? How many of you guys are out there doing marketing right now? Okay, one, two, two, did you raise your hand as well? Okay, good. So marketing is the key to your business. Marketing is the key to any business, um, but especially when it comes to real estate. And you know, one of the things that I, I like to say is, is, is you know, if uh, I just kind of give Coca-Cola as a demonstration, you know, if, if Coca-Cola, one of the most well-known brands in the world, is every single day, every single hour, every single minute, every single second, in every single language, in every single country, except maybe Russia right now. Uh, but, but if they are advertising, right, at, you know, and, and they've got one of the biggest, most well-known brands, what do you think you are gonna have to do for your little mom and pop brand? You're gonna have to do marketing. Uh, that's gonna be the key to your business and the key to a successful business. And that's one of the things that I see a lot of uh, new investors uh, not do or not do enough of or depend on other people to be able to do that for them. So for example, how many of you guys are in contact or thinking about working with a wholesaler? Okay, okay, a couple of you guys, just, just two, okay. Um, so wholesaler, just I wanna make sure you guys all have the wholesaler rules of thumb, there's two of them. Uh, number one, they always say the ARV is here and the ARV is really here. Number two, they always say the repairs are here and the repairs are really here. So if there's this much delta, there's, they basically squeeze out all of your profit. So a wholesaler will take all of the risk-free profit and their wholesale fee and they, they'll give you all of the risk-full profit in actually taking the project to the finish line. And I will say that a lot of times I see um, new investors ignore this cognitive bias that there might be a conflict of interest on the person who's bringing me the deal. So they're, they don't stop to think, well, maybe this person's giving me the wrong ARV, the after repair value, what this property will ultimately sell for when it's uh, put back on the market. And what if this person's giving me the wrong repair estimate, right? And or the wrong time frame. What does that look like for me? So you have to realize that a wholesaler only gets paid if you believe those two things that they are telling you. And, and what I will tell you is that most wholesalers will, again, overestimate that, that ARV 
and or underestimate that repair, uh, that final repair bid. And I've seen a lot of new investors lose money by working with a wholesaler because they're trusting that due diligence. They're not doing their own due diligence because they're not identifying that immediate conflict of interest. So what that looks like is you get excited. I've got my first opportunity for a deal. I need to take immediate action, right? And I don't have enough information and or I'm ignoring the obvious. So I'll just ask you guys that if you are working with a wholesaler, which is fine, and I've wholesaled properties many times, um, you still need to take it upon yourself to verify those two pieces of information and run it through the, what we call the maximum allowable offer formula to make sure that the number actually makes sense. When it comes to uh, these types of deals, a lot of times, um, you know, I, you know uh, there's, there's a quote that I, I love, I love to hate, and that is, a fool and his money are soon parted, right? For some reason, I thought that was Shakespeare, but it's actually somebody else. I can't remember who it was. Uh, but um, uh, fullness money are soon, are soon parted. And, and, and what that looks like is, and especially for, and I see it happening in, in the Austin market probably more than any of the other markets, but a lot, of, a lot in the Austin market, where you have people who are making a lot of money. You have people who maybe have saved up already maybe half a million dollars to be able to do that first deal. And they're not having anyone look over their shoulders. They're not having anyone coach them, mentor them, share with them uh, best practices, or any of the tribal knowledge for both the things that, again, can go right and the things that can go wrong. So what I'll see is they'll find a wholesaler and they'll say, great, this is just like I saw on TV. I'm ready for my close-up, right? I got the house. Let's go. And then they don't realize until they get to the finish line, oops, I, the, the numbers were all wrong and I've lost money on this deal. Welcome to real estate investing. So um, in order to make sure that none of you guys are a fool uh, whose money is soon departed from you, I would recommend having someone look over your deal. Who's one of the best people that you can get to look over your deal before you buy it to tell you whether or not that deal is, 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 is a good deal? A realtor, a coach, who, what else were you saying? A realtor, who else? Lawyer, who else? CPA, who else? Investor, who else? Yourself, who else? Does anybody in here want some free coaching, free advice on your deal? On your deal? Who wants that? Who wants a little free coaching or free advice on your deal? Yeah, take you, I'm only talking to you and you. Thank you for playing, I appreciate it. All the rest of you, I know you're out there. I can literally hear you breathing, okay? So let's, let's, let's have some fun here. Um, uh, thank you, R Rosie, for laughing, I appreciate that. And you're, gonna, you're gonna be in my front row when I go to stand-up comedy. But listen, if you want free coaching on your deal, especially if you have a lot of money, and especially if you plan on paying cash for your deal, take your deal to a lender, a hard money lender. And that hard money lender is gonna give you some of the best free advice you've ever received in your entire life. Now, you do have to have what I call the hard money ring, uh, hard money decoder ring. So sometimes they're gonna give you a straight up, no, I'm not gonna fund your deal. So basically they're telling you, number one, you don't have a deal. So that doesn't mean abandon the deal, but that might mean go back and renegotiate it. If you can't go back and renegotiate it, then that means then terminate the, terminate the offer, right? Um, but, and so I wanna make sure you guys are uh, aware of this kind of hard money ring decoder, decoder ring that I say. So uh, what that looks like is if they tell you, and a lot of times they'll do this, I wanna make sure you guys are aware of this, this should be a flag for you. If they tell you, I will fund your deal, but you have to bring $50,000 to the closing table, what have they just told you? It's not a deal, okay? It's not a deal. And they don't wanna take the risk on your not a deal. Now, here's where it gets a little tricky. Hard money lender is saying, okay, this person has a full-time job, they're making 100 grand a year, this person has great credit. They've got a 750 credit score. What do I know this person will not do? Default. Default. And how do I 
make it a little bit better for me as a hard money lender. I risk shift to them by having them put down more money. Right? You guys follow that? That's the hard money decoder ring code. It's not everybody sees that. Like a lot of people are, will tell me like, well, my hard money lender is making me, you know, bring thirty or fifty thousand dollars to the closing table. I'm like, did you not just hear what you said? You know, most hard money lenders will fund any deal that's seventy percent of ARV minus repairs in a heartbeat overnight. But if your deal's not, they are either not going to fund it or they're going to risk shift to you and basically say, hey, put your money where your mouth is or put your money where your research is. So, so just be aware of, of those things. So. With, with wholesalers, um, I always say, I don't care, you know, when they're bringing me something uh, that is, I had a wholesaler bring me a deal uh, the other day uh, that was, uh, if uh, it was, I want to say they were trying to uh, wholesale it to me for over 600. I think the ARV was 700 and it basically needed $80,000 in repairs. I don't see where my profit is there. There is no profit there. So for me, I always say, I don't care whether you are incompetent or a liar, either way, I don't want to do business with you, right? Uh, so, so guys, I will just ask, um, I, I, I will just ask, uh, pray that each one of you guys will do your own due diligence every time that you look at a deal. So a couple of you guys said, get a realtor, yes. Have a realtor look at it and give you the real value of that, okay? Um, bring your own contractor. Don't just listen to what their contractor is telling you. Um, really important in order to make sure that you don't lose money as a real estate investor. This is a hot market. This is a great market. This is one of the best markets we've ever that I've ever invested through. Um, but there still are as many opportunities to make money as a real estate investor as there are to lose money as a real estate investor. So I want you guys to be uh, very, very aware of that. And then the other thing is, I will tell you that the one thing that wholesalers do really, really well is what? What's the one thing that they just kick butt at, that they are the best at? What is it? Marketing. Marketing to find deals. Marketing to find deals. So if there's any lesson that I want you to take away from a wholesaler is the marketing lesson. Because when I asked you guys who in here is marketing, I think two people raised their hands. I think the rest of you are like oh, procrastinators. I'll do it later. It's too, too hard, too hard. So uh, is there anyone in here, I'm curious, as actively working on a deal right now? Anybody who's actively working on a deal? Um, remind me of your name, sir. Mark. Mark? Yeah, um, Mark, would you um, like a little help on your deal? Do you need any help on your deal? You feel like you got it? Like it's right now, for the attorney tomorrow, I think she's working with about half that we're going to try. Okay. Actually, not, actually, that's a good detective. It's okay. not very good with the hands and does in here, but it's supposed to be anybody else can detect it. Okay. Where is the where is the property? I'm curious. So, will you will you walk over to the microphone if you'd be open to that? On the Gulf Coast of Mississippi, is that where you're from? That's correct. Okay, awesome. Well, uh, let me see if I can get this set up so we can get you on camera here too. <laughs> that's a bonus. Uh, that's included. <laughs> so, yeah, you can fix your hair. It looks Perfect. good. Yeah, Thank it looks you. good. Yeah, yeah. I'm ready. Uh, so, so tell me what. So it sounds like there's a little hang out. It sounds like there might be a little hair on the deal. Uh, there's been a lot of hang ups it's been going on for eight months. It's my first large commercial-ish type of property, okay. small RV park, self-storage shed, have a background in single family homes on the coast, and a girlfriend and I just moved to Austin, so looking forward to spreading my wings here, but okay. got to wrap up that deal there uh, in the meantime, and um, waiting on one of many uh, pieces to, to fall into place, so we can Okay, get okay, to the so line. I just want to uh, read you a little headline um, that I saw today in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, commercial real estate shows signs of cooling. This sector is being disrupted by rising interest rates that are already causing some deals to collapse. 
and it shows the commercial property sales volume change from a year earlier. And uh, this is the first quarter where the number is inverted. So I'm curious, uh, funding. How Creative funding, work? owner financing. Owner financing, wonderful. What's the rate on that? Depending on what piece we're talking about, there's about three different parts to it and owners and pieces to it. The most interest we're paying is 5% above prime, which just got raised to 9% in total. Okay, okay, okay. And your deal still works at that number? Yeah. Okay, oh, yeah. okay. So that's why I was look, reading that article today because I think a lot of investors are going in slim and as those rates start to rise, it gets it gets more it gets more slimmer for sure <laughs> and i'm sure if you were if you had closed on it eight months ago uh you know before you found all the hairs on the deal it probably would have been you know at least two points lower right which Better, does make absolutely. a difference uh which does make a difference are you syndicating that deal or is it just you okay wonderful well my brother and i equal partners okay okay um so uh would you care to share some of the uh, hairs you had to take off to take off that deal I don't know how much time we got. Um, Just share the, one. The short of it is two separate properties owned by three different people and having to get into to two different attorneys for us and three different owner financing arrangements. And eight months later, we're real close to inking it. So it'll be okay. worth it when it's done. Okay. But that's okay. the okay. hassle you go through to find deals. And we Absolutely. are certainly earning our equity on this project to say the least. So um, is it is it a, a value play? So you're going to be making improvements, raising the rents? Yeah. Yep. Okay, good. Um, what's the occupancy on it now? About half. Wow. Okay, so there's a lot of opportunity there. A lot of opportunity. And then um, are you, um, is the net operating income and your purchase price based on that 50% occupancy? No, they're based off of almost completely irrelevant things. Okay, well, that's, that's, that never happens in real estate. Rarely. <laughs> that's why we're still at it eight months later trying to get into the Okay, 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 okay. Uh, so, uh, well, thank you for sharing. I was just kind of curious. Uh, so, I will tell you that, um, and, I, and I think uh, we are probably cut from the same cloth, and, and the thought process that, you know, the best deals for us are the deals with the most hairs on it. Uh, so, think of it as like a, and this is going to sound gross um, and unappetizing, but Think of it as a, like a hair in, hair in your French fr hair in your cheesy fries, right? <laughs> that's not, that's like, oh, uh, but if you're able to dissect it, right, in a way that doesn't pollute the entire dish, uh, and uh, there's, you know, maybe a, you know, half million dollar payday at the end of it, then guess what? You're gonna figure out how to dissect it. Uh, there's also a, a lot of opportunities when you have something that's at only at 50% occupancy. Uh, to create that value play, to be able to bring that value up, to go back and resell it after a term of anywhere from, most commercial projects are three to five years, but some of the self-storage can go a lot faster just because you can turn those units much faster. Um, and, it's, and it's different than say, for example, um, an apartment complex that you know, does take that, that longer period of time. So. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, thank for you very sharing. much. I appreciate that. Got to yeah. pick those hairs out and keep eating. I think that's the uh, the key to what you are saying. Yeah, pick yeah. Those hairs out of the cheese fries. Yeah. So I mean, um, you know, it's funny. I was talking to a, a young investor uh, this past weekend, um, and he, and when I say young, he was ten, and his and his and his entire so it was it was mom, dad, uh, uh, him, and his sister, and he was talking about one of the fix and flips that is family is working on and they kind of showed us the before picture and they showed us the after picture and he kind of commented it was the worst smelling place you know I've never you know cat pee and dot you know I just like every single thing putrid thing you could think of and my husband leaned over and he said son that's the smell of money <sighs> let's go get it <laughs> <laughs> so, so guys, uh, I do want you to, you know, be aware that, you know, for, for, for us as real estate investors, um, we typically don't get the pretty house, right? We typically don't get the house on the perfect street. We typically don't get the house with the most street appeal or the best layout, right? 
uh, we get, you know, a dumpy, you know, hoarder or extreme collector uh, house. Uh, that's the euphemism now for uh, hoarders. Uh, I, I, thought, I thought that was really cute. So, so we get those extreme collector houses as real estate investors. And uh, that's one of the fun things that we get to do. Uh, but that's also one of the challenging things that we get to do. So for us, the ones, the folks that are able to make money as real estate investors are the ones that are able to overcome some of those different obstacles. And I want for all of you guys to be able to overcome those different obstacles when they come up uh, because uh, uh, they're uh, solving easy problems. That's not where the money is at. It's solving the very complex problems. Uh, for me, I often say I buy houses from people who don't want to sell them and solve unsolvable problems and do it on unachievable timelines, right? Because most of the houses, not most, um, a large majority of the houses that I'm buying, they're going to foreclosure. And so there's a hard deadline, in fact. What, what is today again? It's the first, it's the sixth, it's the first Tuesday, which in the banks, the banking industry call it Super Tuesday here in Texas because that's when they take all the properties to auction. So we auction here in Texas once a month, the first Tuesday of the month. And, uh, uh, you know, this is usually where, like the week before, I'm doing like all of my grocery shopping for my business, right? Collecting all of those houses, picking up all those houses. And a lot of those houses that we buy from, the owners don't want to sell those properties. Don't want to sell those properties. They don't want to move. And they have a lot of hairs on those deals. And a lot of times, even though I might have been marketing to them for multiple months, they don't call me until the week before the auction. So that's basically a, if there's enough equity here, I wanna drop everything and I wanna go specifically after that. Uh, so those are, the, uh, those are where a lot of the opportunities are. Um, I've got some slides on here that are playing as well that talk about some of the different marketing strategies that you can use as a real estate investor. And one of the things that we love to share with the members of the association is our real estate investor blueprint. So we actually brought some with, it, with us. Uh, these are three foot by two foot uh, blueprints that go through the, some of the 272 different things that we learned, we've learned about investing uh, as we've been doing this for almost two decades. So this is something that we get to share with the members of the association to help break out and help them break out their personal business plan. plan. So it goes through number one, the marketing, number two, the different strategies that we use as a real estate investor, number three, the, the sales and negotiation part of, of this business. So if you are not comfortable with that, you got to get comfortable with that. It goes through the analysis and the due diligence to make sure that we don't lose money. It goes through all of the different funding options. How many of you guys knew that you could buy properties in your self-directed IRA, old 401k turned self-directed IRA? Uh, so for us, that's how we own several of our rental properties. That's we do loans out of our self-directed IRA. We own shares of commercial assets in our self-directed IRA. And then the last portion of that blueprint uh, goes through uh, the operation side. So it goes through uh, you swinging your own hammer in your business to you hiring somebody, somebody else to swing that hammer for you. So I'm curious, how many of you guys are uh, in a corporate America job? This is the interactive part, really. None of you guys work at all, really. Okay, okay. How many of you guys want to leave that corporate America job? Okay you still have your tie on. Let's, let's loosen up. Yeah, let's get it off. I can cut it off for you. Uh, I, I work from home, but I didn't know you hire me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what is your name, sir? Uh, my name's Jared. Jared? So Jared said, I worked from, uh, Jared's wearing a tie for those of you guys who can't see him. Uh, but uh, so, so, so he said, I work from home, uh, but I didn't know what the attire tonight at the Real Estate Investor Association meeting would be, so I wanted to, you know, look sharp. So, my, my Your mom is right uh, to be the best best dress. Um, can your mom talk to my son? Because right now, like you know, at 13 years old, we're not communicating super well. Uh, no, but seriously, um, you'll know. Like I'm just trying to uh, just kind of spy the audience. Like you'll know the the real estate investor is 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 the is the guy typically in the Hawaiian shirt because like every day is like a Hawaiian shirt day. Uh, so so that's the fun part of being a real estate investor. But I will tell you guys, I, you know, my guess is, and you guys are not being super interactive with me, which kind of bums me out, but I will ask this other question, which is how many of you guys are like 
super stoked and looking forward to like I can't wait to get into this my first fix and flip and I can't wait to swing my own hammer and take down some walls and tear some stuff up and then and then you know put some stuff back and then paint some stuff and then okay okay wow okay about half of you guys raise your hand you're all wrong um, you're all wrong um, and, but I know where you're going. Like it feels like, you know, especially if you're, you know, working in a cube or at home all day, right? It feels good to like tear something down. It feels good to build it back up, right? Um, I thought that when I first started investing in real estate too. In fact, one of my first capital expenditures as a real estate investor was a trailer that I used to haul stuff off. As a young real estate investor, as uh, 20 years ago, I've made more trips to the city dump than I care to admit, okay? Um, and literally, like, my trips to the city dump, like, when my husband's in the back of the room, this is when we were dating. He'd always take me to the nicest places. <laughs> so, so literally, when we were leaving the dump, like, you know, it was like, we were just, like, leaving the, throwing the gloves out on the way out, just didn't want to get, didn't want any more of that. But... And it, but it did feel good, and I'm sure a lot of you guys, like, you know, are like, I've been in spreadsheets all day, I'm in PowerPoint all day, like, I want to, like, be connected to something. It did feel good, um, but at some point, we both realized that that feel-good emotion from, like, tearing stuff up and getting stuff done was costing us in our ability to scale our business. So when you are doing everything, you're not gonna be able to grow the business. You're only gonna be able to do probably two projects every year. Two projects every year, if your average pro profit's 60,000, 120,000, I don't, I don't know if for many of you guys that's gonna be enough to push the needle, right? Um, I, hold, hold on one sec, I don't know if that's gonna be enough for, to push the needle for you guys. Some of you guys may, may say, I'm making 60, so 120 sounds great, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll go ahead and do it all myself. But at some point, you're going to realize that you're getting in your own way. You're stopping your own ability to be able to grow and scale your business to something that is, is not just um, incremental, incremental and arithmetic improvements, but really, truly geometric improvements. So um, <laughs> the further, so, 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 so as uh, my husband and I uh, were investing, I slowly started to give away all of his tools. So we have a three-car garage. For years, I could not park in a single bay of the three-car garage because it was all filled with tools. Now, some of you guys are like salivating, like you're like, I can't wait to meet this guy. He sounds like the coolest guy ever, like, you know, all those tools, right? Well, all those tools were getting in the way of us being able to scale our business. All those tools were having us doing minimum wage activities like going to the dump, right? Uh, cleaning out a house. So for us, what we realized, and Phil, I'm gonna need you up here in the next couple of minutes. Uh, what we realized at, is, that, is that us being, you know, us having a feel good about doing all the work ourselves was getting in the way of us growing our income in a geometric way, right? And really pushing the dial, really moving it to something that we were proud of growing. So um, I want you guys to kind of um, learn from our lessons um, and, 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 and get that high of, you know, doing that over on your first deal and, and then move on to do something uh, that's gonna have, uh, that's gonna be so much more impactful. So uh, that is my hope for you guys. So thank you all for watching and listening for those of you guys who are online.